So, you want to run the D&D 5e starter set adventure Lost Mine of Fan Delver, but you don't have time to read the book or never learn to read in the first place. Well, then let me explain it as quickly as I can. Spoilers, obviously. Introduction. Welcome to Dungeon Mastering. Here are your dice, your DM screen, and your crippling anxiety that you aren't running the game well enough to keep your players engaged. In this section, you'll learn that a DM is a referee for player actions, a narrator for the story, and the guy killing everyone since you read the monster stat block incorrectly and gave it four attacks per round. You also learn how to make players roll the clicky clacks to buy yourself time to make up the parts of the adventure you forgot to prepare. Also, here are some terms you might need to know. Once you got all that down, it is time to learn what this adventure is all about. A long time ago, there was a nice cave that some dwarves and gnomes liked. Then some humans got involved and they made a startup company selling magic items. Some orcs came by and wanted to complete a hostile takeover of that enterprise. This did not go over well with management and that nice cave became a collapsed cave with everyone inside very much dead. Now some dwarves want to uncollapse the cave and a spider wants to try that hostile takeover business again, perpetuating the cycle of capitalism. But how will your player characters get embroiled in this small business battle, you ask, your inanimate computer screen which has no way to respond? Well, the player characters are going to be contract workers for the dwarves. This comes with no health benefits or retirement options unless they want to retire to dead. Also, here's some information about a generic fantasy setting and a nice map. Part 1. Goblin Arrows After dragging a wagon around for a few days, the player characters will stumble upon two dead horses in the first possible TPK. Pray the four goblins hiding in the woods don't roll high on their stealth check, otherwise this will look a lot less like a battle and a lot more like the end of 300. After they've dealt with the goblins, they can head on down the path, hitting two traps along the way to reach the goblin hideout. Here they'll find the security guard that did not do a good job at securing or guarding, and a goblin that wants to climb the corporate ladder by killing his bugbear boss. That boss is twice his size and could kill him with a single hit, but hey, this place is run by an equal backstabbing opportunity employer. Part 2. Vandalin. A frontier town made on the ruins of Old Phandalin, sporting the glowing review of not being destroyed by orcs yet like Old Phandalin was. Feel free to let the party walk around collecting side quests from the retired adventurer, the town master, the town's actual master, the nice farm lady, or the nice temple lady that wants the proletariat to seize the means of production. If they walk around long enough, a group of mean men with red cloaks show up to angrily attack them for not completing their quest line yet. When one of those mean men runs from the ensuing fight, he'll lead them directly to the mean man hideout located under a house. This subterranean man cave is ruled by a glass staff, a dude that wields a glass staff. This group cannot be called inventive, but at least they have a one-eyed creature that can tell your party random trivia about themselves. Part 3. The Spider's Web This part has a lot less spiders and a whole lot less webs than anticipated, but there are still some, mostly in the corners where no one has swept for a while. Of the five locations listed in this section, two lead to the final plot cave and three others are for those that just like playing the game. How dare they? Of those three minor locations, the party could go to one if they want to ask a question to a ghost, but only if they have a hair comb. They should go to another if they want to talk to Indiana Jones, if Indiana Jones was an introvert that hung out with the undead instead of damsels in distress. And they should go to the third one if they want to just grind XP and loot like this is an MMORPG, or they really hate orcs. If that final statement is true, you might need to do better diversity and inclusion training for your adventurers going forward. Of the two important locations, one is a ruin and the other is a ruin. I'm starting to notice a pattern. In Lightning Stump, the party will find some stick boys and zombies that need to moisturize. If they get through those enemies, you get to reward them with dying in a TPK to a dragon and its growing following of fangirls. And by fangirls, I mean cultists and cosplay. There is a park ranger in the area that can help the party, but only if they drive off the dragon so the area can return to its natural state of dead people and things that cause more dead people. In the other, other ruins, Castle Edition, there's a four-pronged murder noodle, eight cooks, and a bear that the party will have to deal with, but like a mean bear that screeches and has an owl head. Oh, and a king that hides everything of importance in his mattress like a Great Depression-era grandma. Part 4. Wave Echo Cave for a place that was collapsed 800 years ago, there's a surprising amount of not-so-collapsed areas, but it is filled with undead, so that seems about right. If the player characters want to explore the area, they will need to get past a flaming soul that can create more flaming skulls, though only temporarily, a wraith that will not give up his pipe that was definitely just for tobacco use officer, a beholder, but not really, but kind of, and a big group of spiders. If they get through all of that, their reward is one living dwarf and one dead dwarf, as well as a bunch of items that could have helped them with that dragon just that killed them a few days back. From above. 